So Bruce, we're here to talk about the Bible in the Reformation, celebrating the 500th anniversary of the Reformation uh, in 2017. But before we get to the actual Reformation itself, we thought it was a good idea to go back a step and talk about what the Bible was like before the Reformation in the medieval period, in part because although I think most people would think that well, the Bible has always been the Bible, right? It's the same book, authoritative, and we know what is in it from now all the way back, really. It's not really true. In the medieval period, the Bible was actually considerably different from, from the way we think about it today. Yeah. I mean, one of the things that's is often said, Joel, is that in the, the Reformation discovered the Bible, that it was a, a recovery of something that had been lost. But in fact, you know, biblical uh, texts were very well known in medieval times. The people had access to scripture through a variety of ways. The Bible was central to the study of theology in the universities. The people heard the words of scripture in the liturgies of worship in the mass, uh, that people encountered biblical stories through the representations of, on walls of churches, even from the humblest parish churches. People saw images of parables, New Testament and Old Testament stories. So there's a variety of ways in which the Bible was encountered. But of course, in its most well-known form was the Vulgate, you know, which was the Latin translation of the Bible made by Jerome. Right. Again, though, when we think about the Vulgate, I think a lot of us think, well, Jerome translated the Bible into Latin, and that was it. And, yeah. it, and it's been that ever since. And the Vulgate we pick up today, if one picks up a Latin Bible today, is the same, is the same that, uh, that one picked up 500 years ago. Yeah. But again, the Vulgate itself was not quite as fixed as, we, as yeah. we tend to think. I think we have to think of what the Vulgate actually was. You know, it appears in the late fourth century. Jerome is this extraordinary figure. And again, there's this idea that he simply translated from Hebrew and Greek into Latin, but the story is far more complicated. He drew on a whole range of, of sources, including the Septuagint and the old Latin translations, which were Latin versions of the Septuagint. And he drew upon uh, translations that already existed to create this text, a Latin, edition of the Old and New Testaments, and it becomes an established text. Sometime after Jerome was dead, there was considerable opposition to it as when it first appeared, but it lives through the Middle Ages and establishes itself as the main form of the Bible. But it's, of course, this is the age of, of pre-printing, so the text is reproduced uh, scribally, and this introduces over time a great number of variations. So the Vulgate itself is not one Bible, it's not one fixed text across Europe. It exists in many forms, and there are attempts to bring together it into a standard form, but those are not entirely uh, successful. So there's no one uh, fixed uh, text of the Bible, and, uh, but it is uh, known that a large number of errors are creeping into it and that these errors are creating a text that is perhaps no longer uh, the one that Jerome himself had uh, uh, translated, although his name remains associated with it. There's a sense actually in which we think of the Latin Bible, the Jerome's Bible, as this, this one thing, but it's, it's actually much more akin to, I think, maybe our situation today with English translations of the Bible, where there are you know, there was one that was done, which we'll get to later on. I yes. mean, there were, there were some famous ones, but these days there's, you know, 15, 20 quite well-known English translations, all of which are slightly different, some of which I'm sure have errors that have crept into them. Yes. But to remember that, you know, when Jerome did his work, the Vulgate was, the Latin was, was not a, a holy language in the no, same way. Right? No, it was, it was It was a vernacular. But by the medieval period, Latin had become sort of the language of the church, yes. and the Vulgate and the Latin Bible was the standard uh, for the church. And when we think about the Reformation, we often think about translations from the Latin into vernacular. But in fact, in the medieval period, there were already the beginnings of vernacular translations. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, certainly you see this by the 13th century, and in the first place, we look to France, and there are a whole range of translations that are translations from the Vulgate into French. And we know that in the period from about 1200 to 1350, that we have over 600 
Bibles that have survived. So there's an extraordinarily rich culture of vernacular uh, editions of the Bible. Then you get the Bible appearing in England. You get 1383, the translation which is known as the Wycliffe Bible, prepared not only by uh, John Wycliffe himself, but by a group of colleagues, uh, becomes associated with the Lollards. This Bible is then banned at the Oxford Synod in the early uh, 15th century, so that English translations are then prohibited, which makes for a particular situation in England. But in France and in Germany, in Catalonia, in Spain, Spain, you're getting by the late Middle Ages a whole range of uh, translations into the, to the vernacular. So this is not unknown in Europe before the Reformation, but of course it's for the most part it's it's pre-printing. Right, but there was there was clearly some sort of antagonism toward the idea of the vernacular. What's why? Right. Well, these, day, these days, yeah. it's hard to imagine, yeah, right? Because we all experience to, it's it. It's hard to imagine like. because, of course, it's so much the norm for us. But of course, it, once you take the Bible out of Latin into these variety of languages. I mean, one has to remember that the vernacular in the Middle Ages, as it is in the, medieval, in the, in the early modern period, has a, an enormous number of forms. There's no fixed uh, language. There's no French as we think of French. There's no German as we think of French or of, of German or of, of Spanish. Uh, there's a great range uh, within the languages, and suddenly you're moving from this set form, which is in the Vulgate, to an extraordinarily diverse range of topics, and of course this makes the church very nervous. Mm -hmm. uh, it's putting the Bible into the language of the people, although of course most people can't read, but it's putting the Bible into their language and, and putting it beyond the control of the church. Now in somewhere like Germany, which is in, in the empire, um, that these lands are so uh, fragmented that there's very little central control, but in England, as we've seen, there is real control over translations and they try to prohibit them. So in a sense, there's a, there's a tension between a desire on the part of authorities to maintain a, a fixed set, controllable text, yeah. controllable Bible, and on the other hand, simply the social state of, of Europe at the time, which was very fragmented yeah. and in largely illiterate, yeah. in which people were experiencing the Bible either through this, the Latin that they may not have been able to understand, yeah. but more often through images and stories and uh, liturgy. And devotional um, texts. And devotional uh, books of hours. Yes, books of hours, yeah. And, and yet there's the irony that, as you said, the, the Latin text itself was somewhat fragmented and, and, and not uniform. Yes. So it's, it's, it's sort of an illusion of control over the material yes. r rather than an actual Yes, control. and I think you know, we need to remind ourselves, just as you say, that there are no centralized states you know, that we might think of later. England, you know, is, is extraordinarily diverse in its, in its regions, as is the, you know, the empire and as is France. So the, so the idea that control can be exercised in, in any kind of modern way is simply not the case. Is that true for, for church institutions also? I mean, it seems to be that, that you have a real antipathy toward the vernacular in England, but yeah. less so in France, because yes. we, there is no sort of centralized, top-down. Uh, no, no, no. I mean, we, often people have this image of the medieval church as being this extraordinarily centralized hierarchy yeah. uh, that uh, exercises control and with you know, the emergence of the inquisitions and such things. There's nothing like that. So there is a culture in which uh, texts can emerge and circulate without any particular control over them. So prior to the Reformation, and really, in many ways, prior to the printing press, mm -hmm. which is a major moment, mm -hmm. the Bible sort of didn't exist, for the most part, as a book, mm -hmm. the way that we, I mean, we don't think of it as almost anything else, right? Yes. Of course the Bible is a book, but people were experiencing it in, in bits and pieces, in stories. What, is that, what does it mean to say that the Bible wasn't a, wasn't a book at that time? What, what, was the, what was the Bible in the medieval period? I mean, that, the Bible, as I you know, began with, existed in terms of you know, people's experience of it through a whole range of things, from worship to devotion to preaching to images on, on walls. But it was rarely of existing as a book, as you say, because you know, what would they have used it for? You get in the 13th century with the production of, of the Vulgate in, in a variety of, of forms, the first instances really of people possessing books or Bibles as you know, their own book. But this is a very small number 
of people. One of the things that Gutenberg revolutionizes with the production of the Vulgate in the middle of, of the 15th century is that he makes it available as a book and people use it in a variety of different ways. We, we know that it was used in monasteries for reading. We know that it was used by individuals, both for their own reading, as, but as a devotional uh, object. But most people would not encounter the Bible as a book in, in the medieval period as we think of it, or as will emerge in the Reformation. Right, so we really have to talk about Gutenberg yes. uh, a, little bit, a little bit more than we've done. We've alluded to it, but mm -hmm. this was, I mean, as, I think everybody knows, right? One of the great moments of, uh, of sort of technological and social progress, really, of the, you know, the, the modern era. Yes. Uh, Gutenberg, first thing he prints, obviously, is what we think of as the Gutenberg Bible. Yes. Right? Uh, we have them here at Yale yeah. and, and elsewhere. But that doesn't actually describe what it was. I mean, nobody said, oh, that's a Gutenberg Bible. The text was not Gutenberg's. No. What was it? It was a Vulgate. It was a Latin text. It was a Latin Bible, yes. The particular... Uh, it comes from the Paris Bible, it was pre which, was, which emerged uh, uh, in the 13th century. So it was as close as what I think one could say to a standardized version of the... But of course, with Gutenberg producing it and it being then distributed, that, of course, makes it much more of a standard text. And this is, of course, what printing does. It makes possible the emergence of standard versions of texts, which when, you know, in the culture of, of scribes was simply not the case. Right, it's probably worth sort of reminding ourselves how long it would have taken a scribe to produce a copy of, say, the Paris Bible. Yes. I mean, we're talking probably about a, a year's labor. Yes, you're talking for, about... For a single copy. For a single copy. And now Gutenberg is running them off you know, it's taking, in, in, in batches of 500. Yeah, yeah. I mean, he, you know, printing a Bible, and this is true in, in the 16th century as well, is an extraordinarily expensive endeavor. I mean, Gutenberg made sure that by subscription he had sold his before he produced them because he knew this was, ex, you know, mm -hmm. a remarkably uh, costly endeavor because you have, you know, the, you can't sell any of it until you've produced the last part of it. So right. you've got to go through the whole text. And so it's sitting there until you have finished it. And so it's not like what had previously existed and would it continue in, in the early modern period. You could, you could have a Psalter or you could have a Pentateuch or you could have a New Testament. But you know, Gutenberg produces the whole Bible, which is a major endeavor. And so the Bible printing will remain through the early modern period, one of the most expensive forms of producing books. If there's a sense in which then, the idea of Bible as a book is not only something that comes about as a result of the printing press, but also is sort of tied into the market forces around selling books that are yes. produced by printing press. Yes. That is, if he needs to sell the whole thing, if he needs to finish a, a thing, a book, yeah. Yeah. right? Suddenly, there's a concept of a book. Yep. Yeah, and and you know, Gutenberg begins the the printing revolution. And it is, as he understood it very clearly, uh, an economic question of how to, how to produce this. And he knew that he had, as they say, he had to sell them to be able to finance what he's doing. Paper is very expensive. Also, you know, the ink is expensive. All of it is expensive. The labor, expertise to be able to do this, the, the press itself. Many a printer goes under, uh, you know, both in the late 15th century and in the 16th century by producing things that don't sell. Right. or uh, having competition that uh, puts you out of business. I mean, Erasmus, as we'll talk about later, you know, produces his 1516 New Testament, and one of the things he does is to ensure that nobody else can, particularly the Complutensian polyglot, which comes out of Spain, is not going to be sold in Germany because he knows that that could be ruinous competition. Mm -hmm. So printing is very much uh, tied up in, in, in business. Activity. Yeah, I think, I think as, we, as we sort of come to close on, on, on thinking about what the Bible, th this transitional moment yeah. and what the Bible was like before is, is the reminder that for us, the material form of the book is something we very much take for granted. Yes. Whereas this was really an important transition that happens in the Reformation. And it's not just a conceptual issue of uh, how we think about the Bible or its text or its meaning or what it's for, but literally, transforming the, you know, what the Bible is physically, materially. It goes from being something that is experienced in bits and pieces to a book. 
And that's a, a notion of it that we absolutely take for granted. But we have to remember was a, a major part of that Reformation change. Yes. I mean, the ma material culture of the Bible is something that is extraordinarily important and belongs to, uh, I would argue, the whole gamut of, of you know, the way in which it was interpreted, the way in which it was prepared, the translations, all these aspects belong together. And to produce uh, a, a Bible in the 15th, but you know, particularly the 16th century, as we're going to, to talk about, meant that you had to have support. That support might come from uh, magistrates or, or civil government or a prince, but you were, you were dependent on that. And that plays into a significant role in what that book is going to look like, as does you know, the, your attitude towards what a translation should be and whether you should have accompanying uh, uh, marginalia and, and prefatory material and all the rest of it. So there's a, many different decisions that are being made in the creation of a book at not least of which, where it can be printed. And where it can be printed is determined by things like, you know, do the printers have access to paper and a whole range of other sources. So it's, it's all connected. Right. So in the next session, we're going to start talking about uh, some of the early figures, uh, Erasmus, whom you mentioned, and some of the transformations that happen in the Reformation. Yeah, I think that's where we're going to go.